Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to season three of the Duke Football Coverage Podcast, brought to you, as always, by Bull City Coordinators. Follow us on our website, bullcitycoordinators.com. Check us out on Twitter, at Duke FB Coverage. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. We are going to kick off season three uh, the same way that we ended season one and sort of started season two. Uh, by having a returning guest come. His name is Matthew from the ACC Weekly Podcast. Matthew and Jeff co-host the longest-running independent ACC podcast, while there still is an ACC, which we'll talk about. I listen to their show regularly, and you should too. Uh, it's I'm glad to have you back. Tell us where we can follow you and find you on Twitter. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm very appreciative for being asked back. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at at Smash underscore ASD on Twitter. However, I may have a new Twitter account soon, depending on what happens with Twitter's management functions and that sort of, that sort of thing. I jest here a little bit. And then All Sports DACC is the site Twitter account. That's allsportsdiscussion.com. Again, that's at All Sports DACC. You can follow my friend Jeffrey Fan on Twitter at, at Talking ACC Sports, and we blog all about ACC sports. We really blog about anything that's sports oriented at allsportsdiscussion.com. And Jeff has given me a long, long leeway, and he has long leeway too on whatever he wants to post up. But we generally post about ACC athletics, Atlantic Coast Conference athletics, and NCAA athletics in general. Well, I enjoyed your comment about Twitter, much like the ACC. We don't know how long it's going to be around for. Um, well, why, don't, why don't we get into the football season? Tell us your overall impressions of how it went for the conference. Well, by all accounts, probably not that great, right? Because if you look at the, if you look at the end in mind here, right, is the ACC going to have a college football playoff team this year? No, it won't. It won't. Uh, will it next year? Yes, there's a very good chance next year. I'm sure we're going to get into that later in this podcast. But, you know, by all accounts, probably probably not very well as, as a whole. I, I think that the ACC could have done much better in uh, the non-conference season. I think they could have done much better in rivalry week against the uh, SEC team. Shout out to FSU, of course, right, for, for winning their rivalry game. But the ACC could have done much, much better. And I think it really, Ben, it all, it, it all starts behind center, right? Jeff and I have always said this, that if you have the, you know, some of the best quarterbacks in the country, you're going to have a better, a better play in conference. I think the last time the ACC really had the best quarterback play in the country was 2016. And, you know, we thought that the ACC might have a chance to get there this year with the QB play, but they couldn't couldn't quite get a could the conference as a whole couldn't really get over the hump. And there's just a whole there's a host of reasons for that, right? You've got coaching turnover, you know, coaching turnover at multiple schools. You know, you've got perhaps some coaches that under have underperformed that you know did a little better this year, but. That's really the key, right? Improve, improve quarterback play, improve position at the skill positions like running back and wide receiver. You know, that's that sort of thing. I could probably go on further about Virginia Tech and pr pr improving it my own personal team about improving it at almost every position on the field, but I'm sure we'll get to that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to go a little out of order because you mentioned Florida State. Yes. Beating, beating Florida. They're arguably the best team in the conference right now, the way that they beat uh, LSU, the way that they dismantled Miami, the way that they beat Florida, and unlike Clemson and Chapel Hill College, they're not backing into the final game of the season for them right now. Absolutely. I think as we head into the 2023 football season, Florida State's probably the clear favorite to win the ACC. I think I'm probably going, probably going into some of my new material tonight for the blog post, but they seem to be on the path to getting their mojo back. And, and as you mentioned, they defeated both the, both Miami and Florida this year. Those are, I mean, getting wins versus your rivals in Florida is a big deal, right? Especially for recruiting and bragging rights, but getting that nice out of conference win against LSU also looks absolutely very good because then they're, they're in the SEC title game this Saturday. Right. So, I mean, that's, it's a big deal for Florida state and they probably, I mean, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm a little sarcastic, Ben. They probably got the better co Memphis coach out of the two. 
and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. I think I think everybody knows what you're referring to as a, as a Virginia Tech fan. <laughs> I, I do want to follow up on something about Coach Norvell and, and FSU. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my law partner is an FSU grad, and I've watched a lot of, of FSU games this year. And watching them play, they're not at where they were when they came into the conference in the, in the ACC. But they're the best they've been in a long time. And so yes. – and just like you teased something, the second interview, which I've already recorded for this season, um, is going to have some discussion about why I'm now, even despite what Coach Norvell did, convinced Coach Elko outright deserved Coach of the Year, as you hear what Duke football was like last year internally, yes. not just win-loss yes. record. But <clears throat> up until that interview, I had thought Norvell had done such a great job to get them back to their point, to their current level that he deserved to be co-coach of the year, at least. And I do think we can't lose sight. If you want the ACC to continue teams like Clemson, Virginia tech, Florida state need to do well. We can't lose sight of what a great job has been done in Tallahassee this year. I agree with you. 100%. I agree with you. 100%. And I mean, everything that you said there, is is correct. I think that if you're going, if you're Florida State here, though, the next the next step, of course, is you know winning, perhaps winning those 50-50 games that you're supposed to win, right? I mean, it's been a, I mean, it's been a little while since they've you know they've defeated NC State, right? And so they have to take that next level of dominating their side of the division. But I agree with you. I think they're on on track to do that. They just have to, you know, they have to take that next step next year. And I think I'll be interested to see if they can make that leap to be the team that I think they can be this year, the, the up in the 20, I should say up in 2023, you know, into the favorite for the conference. Well, and you mentioned NC state, they finished eight and four playing what four quarterbacks. I mean, that's not a bad season for them. That's impressive. It's it is, but see, here's, here's my issue with it with, and I think you probably hear a lot about NC State, Ben, like, should they have, yes, yes, it's true that they went through a lot of quarterbacks and yes, that impacted them. Absolutely. But I don't think that they ever should have lost to Boston College, regardless of their quarterback situation. This is a team that lost to Virginia Tech this year. And I, I, I think that this is the sort of thing that kind of upsets Wolfpack fans. You know what I mean? Where you, you're in this situation, you get this big win versus Texas tech. You perhaps get the, you get this big win versus Wake Forest, because I've kind of been on some NC state fans about their series with Wake Forest. Right. I basically have said that they're a fluke field goal away from being Oh, and five in their last five versus Wake Forest. And then they won, you know, they won this year, but it was, you know, you know, relatively close game against Wake Forest. And then they lost to Boston college. So, they, you know, each time you think that they're turning the corner to be that, you know, I would say that upper division team. And I remember eight wins is nothing to scoff at. That's pretty good. I, that's pretty good, I think, for the most part. But each time that you think they're going to take it ready to the next level, you get what you see against Boston College. And I think that's where the frustration comes with a lot of NC State fans. Right. But looking at, I think, and we'll get into the disappointments of the year, I think the crowning achievement for the ACC this year has got to be. Coach Elko and what happened in Durham. And it's not just the winning the eight games. As I pointed out on my blog, the five conference wins, I think, is more important. And the losses were close. This is a team that easily could have won 10 games. Definitely. I mean, I I, I had, you know, two weeks ago, I, w- I was probably a little earlier than a lot of people, but two weeks ago, I put Micah Elko in as coach of the year uh, because there was – there was such a they, they were in the devils were in bad shape last year. I mean, it was, it all I noticed the discour, you know, I noticed a sense of discouragement from their fans that I haven't seen in a while, right? I mean, so the, which I quite frankly haven't seen in several years. I mean, they have read your posts and I, your posts, but I've also seen, you know, tweets from other fans and things like that. And there was a level of discouragement that I hadn't seen 
in a, in a while. Not to say that Dave Cut, David Cutcliffe doesn't deserve credit for the work that he did at Duke because he had some very good years at Duke and he built them up. But I, I think in the last couple of years, he had gone as far as he could with them. And, and it was the right decision to put some, some new energy into that program. And boy, Mike Elko sure has, and he's brought some, brought some talent on that field too. I mean, it's pretty, it was pretty impressive. I, uh, I remember, you know, I, I was in Norfolk on vacation this year, Ben, and I was there probably in October. It was about the halfway point in the season. And I had dinner with a friend. I had dinner with a couple of friends there. And I, I was saying like, no, I, you know, I don't think that Virginia Tech will beat Duke because Duke has better players than Virginia Tech on the football field. And I, I'm not sure I've really been able to say that before, maybe ever. You know, and that was kind of a startle. That was a, that was a startle. That was a startling point for me to come out and say to somebody. But you know, and sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. But you know, it is what it is. And that's, and that's what I saw about, about the midpoint of the season. So it was impressive for me to see how fast Mike could turn, Mike could turn it around. Well, two points on that. Uh, you mentioned the talent and the, I think the talent was there, but you'll hear a little bit more about this in the next interview that, that we do strength and conditioning has made all the difference for these guys. Uh, Elko hiring Coach Feely, that might be the most important hire right up there with Coach Johns. But you're going to learn a lot more about well, what the what shape the program was in and what a tremendous job Coach Elko did restoring the desire to play football for a lot of these guys. And I can't say enough good things about him, about Nina King, and about what everybody's doing there. A couple more thoughts on maybe some uh, – positives of the year were, were there was there anything else that you took away from the ACC football season as a positive well I mean I think we can say that you know Syracuse certainly turned a corner as well right I mean I I had them in second place for my coach of the year so I mean and they you know they started out the season six and oh and they you know they ended up finishing seven and five which is certainly much better than they did last year right and they they look they look like they could actually be a pretty decent team again next year, you know? So, I mean, the, and they, and they look like they have somebody who can be a dependable, a dependable quarterback at Syracuse too, which is also a good thing. So, you know, I feel like the ACC will be better next year because of the, the co- you know, just because of the improved quarterback play, but that's probably mostly on the Atlantic side of that, on, on the Atlantic side of the house, because we just, as we just saw today, I mean, I think it was it announced today or yesterday. Brennan Armstrong's leaving Virginia. Yep. Yeah. Wow. You know. So. <laughs> well. All right. Let's talk about disappointments. Um, oh, there's so many. So many. Uh, you know, and I hate to talk about UVA's season given what happened there in Charlottesville, um, but we're going to talk about football there. You know, UVA looked like a disaster all year. And I thought this was going to be Coach Elliott's best year because he was going to bring, he was going to have Armstrong. But this looks like Carl Franks all over again. You know, it's interesting because, you know, Brennan Armstrong, I think, is a good quarterback. You know, I thought, and, and he had some huge targets too. I mean, obviously, their season, Virginia's season was maligned by tragedy, right? A terrible tragedy. But he, he had some really big targets on, on there, too. But I think the biggest problem that I noticed with Virginia, Ben, was that when, you know, that Tony Elliott spent so much time coming in trying to recruit the skill positions to make them to sit, make them to stay. And I think for some reason or another, they didn't fit into his system. But the worst part, Ben, is that he didn't recruit the existing offensive line at all. He had a transfer coming in. I think he has a transfer from Dartmouth on his offensive offensive line, you know, FCS powerhouse Dartmouth on his offensive line. I mean, I'm being a little facetious when I say that, but if you're going to FCS schools, you need to go to my home state of North Dakota and go to NDSU, get some of those guys. If you're trying to get some offensive linemen, I'm sure you'd agree with that. They tend to mow people down up there. Yeah. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't, as I think about Elliot, it just seems like he's, he's lost as the head coach. Maybe, you know, he'll turn it around next year, but it's going to be hard to do without a guy like Armstrong who could do everything up until this year. Right. You know, I, I would argue that he may have made him a worse quarterback if it's possible. Um, I would like to say, just let me backtrack one just a little bit. I mean, shout out for real, right, to UNC for winning the Coastal. I mean, I, I do have to say this. I knew that, obviously, you know, this is a Duke foot, football podcast here, but shout out to them for winning that. But at the same time, they should have, this is year four. You're supposed to be this far in year four with these sorts of players, one. And two, you know, you've recruited this well for several years. It shouldn't have taken you this long to, you know, to get this far if you're North Carolina. Three, a lot of your wins came against teams that had coaching changes, right? That, you know, perhaps were in the midst of coaching changes. I think if you can correct me on the math, if I'm wrong, Ben, but I think if Duke would have won that game, they would have had the tiebreaker over a UNC to be in the ACC title game. Is that correct? I'd have to go back and look at what Carolina finished, but I think Duke at that point would have been six and two. I think that might've done it. I'll check yeah, right I, now. I think, I think I think you would have had the tiebreaker with UNC. That's my, I think that's right. I have to, I'll verify that, but I think that, I think that, that probably, that probably is right. So shout, but shout out to UNC for getting it done. I don't think that they'll be able to do it again because other teams are building, other teams are building that up. I mean, I think you've got to, I think you legitimately, I'm saying something really positive here that you have to put Duke in the picture next, next year for getting to that ACC title game. I, I don't think that that's, I think that's a very real possibility. I'm saying that here today. I'm laying my marker in the sand right now. There you go. Well, so, well you got Dwayne Carter, Franklin, you got a lot of key guys coming back and Calhoun, Pankel, um, Samir Hagens, Riley Leonard, the running backs are going to be the same. They've got, I've got to look at the O-line, though, uh, because they do have some older guys on the O-line, and I'm not sure who's leaving and who's staying. That's the only part where it could become an issue, and they're going to have to get some guys in the secondary. But to your point about Duke finished 5-3 and three in conference, Carolina finished 6-2, and two. you changed that one game on the phantom penalty that wasn't really a penalty. Uh, I, I mean, that was a garbage penalty. And look, I'll just say it. I'll say it. The ACC wants Carolina and Clemson in the championship game because this is the last year of the divisions and it's the best ratings you're going to get. So that's why the flag got called. I'll say it. I don't care. Sue me for defamation, ACC. Open up your books. Let me see it. Bring it. Um, But Duke's got, you know, they're going to have a target on their back next year. It's going to be a difficult schedule for them playing Notre Dame and Clemson. But to go back to the ACC championship game, don't you feel like both those teams are just backing into it? I mean, I'm not really excited about it because there's not much that can come from it for the conference. I think you're right. I, I, I'm not sh- I mean, I think it will be high. I think it will be highly attended only because it's been a while since North Carolina has been in that been in that game. And Clemson always travels well for these sorts of games. And so you know, they're always excited about winning the ACC title game, but it, there's no real fanfare around it. You know, I, I'm with you a thousand percent. Let me give you just one other positive, if I could. If there were awards for second half of the season, Louisville played like a top 25 team in the second half of the season. I thought that they played very well. And I think that Scott Satterfield has kind of saved himself from the hot seat this year due to that, due to that effective play. But yes, you're right. The, uh, there's not as much there's not as much going for the ACC championship game but you know it will be I I think it will be highly attended and I also am a big fan of having that game in North Carolina as well in North Carolina as well now you mentioned Louisville and we're trying to make something positive out of the championship game so we're kind of talking about disappointments which is where we will stay and I know I mentioned UVA but really you could also say Miami was the biggest disappointment. They were absolutely the biggest, but pound for pound, they're the most disappointing team in the ACC because they have the, the most talent and is un- underperforming at the lowest level. I don't think there's any other way to say it. 
And I, I've said this a lot. I'll say it again. Making the coaching change that they made, I think, was a mistake. I don't think there was a need to get Manny Diaz out of there. He lost a lot of close games, real close to 10 wins. And you have to change a culture that doesn't need to be changed. What does the future look like for Cristobal? I don't know. This is year one. We'll have to see what we'll have to see what happens. That you know, give me a ask me in a year. <laughs> ask well, me in a year. Here, here is how I think about it, and I know I'm a Blue Devil fan, but they absolutely smoked the Blue Devils last year. Okay. Yes. I was there and it was ugly. And if you're a Miami fan or you're a Miami booster, you're saying, I know Duke is better this year, but that much better than us. There's got to be some pressure starting to build. And especially if you read the local papers after the Duke game. And I mean, frankly, I love to see it happen to Miami, but you know, that has got to be in the back of crystal ball's mind that people are not happy. Uh, oh, for sure it is. But you know, he's, I don't know. And perhaps I take this with a little grain of salt. He's a hometown son. He was part of the program. He'll get a little, he'll get a little flexibility. I, I, I think, I mean, clearly he knows that he's got an excited fan base and an excited media market then, but he'll, you know, he was part of that, you know, the part of, part of the glory years of that program. I think they helped get increased investment in there largely because of him, you know what I mean, into the football program because they knew he was coming. And so, you know, they'll probably, he'll, he'll reevaluate, you know, what his changes need to be in the culture of that program because he did well at Oregon, you know, and I, I don't necessarily think and I don't know, some people think that Oregon is an auto drive program because they get all kinds of money and, you know, whoever can go in there can plug and coach right away. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know, you have to hire a good, co- you have to hire a good coach. You can relate to the players and, you know, maybe some of the, you know, maybe some of those good players who don't want to be at Miami Bend can come up to Virginia Tech because Virginia Tech may actually clear a, a quarter of that roster out. Well, you brought up the Hokies. Let's stay with them. <laughs> I, 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 I know they didn't have a good season when loss oh, no. record, but they started losing close games. And then at the end of the season, they got a win. I think the future may be brighter than a lot of us realize there in Blacksburg. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. That was a pregnant pause. <laughs> I, I legitimately think that Virginia Tech has to turn around a quarter of their roster. You know, they, they need a better quarterback. They need better wide receivers. They need running back talent. They need offensive line talent. And it was hard for me to decide between those four items what they needed more, Ben. You know, I almost, I mean, do you remember the, the Sports Illustrated covers from years ago when Georgetown and North Carolina were on there? You may have seen pictures of it where it was number 1A, number 1B. Yeah, that's kind of the way that it's number 1A, number 1B, number 1C, number 1D for all those four items for what, what Virginia Tech needs right now on the roster. And last year, I don't, you know, how do you get, you know, how do you get, how do I say this? How do you get better in a hurry, Ben? You go to the transfer portal. Right. That's what you have. Don't to do. tell that to Dabo. Yeah. <laughs> well, he may have to do that, too. But that's a different. We'll get to that next. But. Virginia Tech is going to have to go to the transfer portal. And, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I think you no, know, they're not going to turn over a quarter of the roster. I kind of am realistic about that. But they need to actually have some difficult conversations with maybe 15, at least 15 people. And they may have to turn over that many spots. Because I think the talent is that deficient. Last year, the coaches spent so much time trying to redevelop those high school recruiting relationships in Virginia, right? Because you know, when Virginia Tech was good, they were seven five seven exactly, and the eight oh four, yeah, right from Richmond. They were getting a lot of players from those areas. I mean, you, even a lot of the best players from the five four zero, right? I mean, we're going just right down the road. We're going to going to Virginia Tech, and so. He spent a lot of – he and the rest of the coaches spent a lot of last year, year in the Virginia trying to rebuild those sorts of relationships, and they're getting some players from, from Lauren Johnson's program in, in, uh, in Richmond, you know, that sort of thing. So that's – I mean, that's a good thing. But this year, 
you know, they're going to have to milk that transfer portal like a dairy farm because, you know, they didn't do that as much as I thought they could have last year. And anyway, so that's, that's my take on the, <laughs> so <laughs> my take on the Hokies. Other than quarterback, running back, O line, wide receiver, they're in good shape. That's what you're saying. Uh, no. Oh, no. I could, <laughs> I could go down. I could go down the list a little further, but you know, for this show. But I mean, I, I, I would focus there for. I would focus there first. Well, earlier you mentioned expansion of the college football playoff, which would be yes. great for for Dabo and Clemson this year. But what what is he going to do? Because this is kind of the parallel that I've drawn with it. I grew up just outside of Clemson. A lot of my buddies are Clemson fans and they all are saying what we said as Duke fans a couple of years ago, stop promoting the wrong guys from within the system, just because they've been there. Stop doing things the way that you're doing. Cause you've always done them. Bring in someone from outside the program and Cutcliffe was actually good about hitting the transfer portal and getting guys, you know, on the market. He brought in some talented players, but you know, Dabo is just like he, he views it like I, I don't even know how to describe it. Like you know, early Christian missionaries viewed pagans. I mean, I I, I can't I, I say that because I'm listening to a lot of <laughs> older history podcasts right now, and that's the only reason I'm making that reference. But he's just got this real aversion to it that, that I don't understand. So it's interesting that you say that because like, you know, when he first, <clears throat> when he first became a head coach, he wanted to call the place himself, Ben. Do you, I, you remember that when he first was when in that position? Not really. Cause I was in law school then. And okay, so, so sure. Sure. Yeah. In 2000. So in 2000, before, before, I think this was when, Lo, when Logan Thomas was a junior, Virginia tech and Clemson were in the same, we're, at, we're in the ACC championship game. They had, that was the first year, 2011 was the first year that uh, they came down, they came down to, they came to Blacksburg and they won. And that was the first year that Clemson had a different offensive coordinator. And before that, he was calling the place that Dabo was calling the place himself. It wasn't until he was willing to relinquish the play calling duties and sort of become a CEO coach, you know, that he was willing to change. And so he, I think that he's willing to change. I think that he was probably told that he had to change Ben. Otherwise it would risk, you know, risk him having his job when he back then. And I think that he will be willing to do it again. If he, he knows that he needs a good, good mobile quarterback in his system to have a successful offense. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt if he actually brought Jeff Scott back from the South Florida to be his offensive coordinator. I think there's a very real possibility in that. Jeff seems to think my friend, Jeff seems to think that he'll be like an offensive quality control guy, but I think eventually he'll be put into that OC role because he, you know, Jeff's Jeff's not doing that well for quite frankly, South Florida. Right. And he may be, you know, there's always a home for him at Clemson, I would think. And, you know, he was very successful in that role in Clemson. So that may be, uh, you know, that may be a potential option they take, but they do need to go, I think, to the, get a transfer portal quarterback. I think they really should do that. And, and some, you know, and he may actually have a freshman on his rot. You know, he's been very reluctant to start the younger players on his roster. And, you know, he did that, you know, he finally, you know, a few years back, he finally did that with, D, you know, with DJ. And so, you know, I think that, you know, he may have an opportunity, you know, to do, to do just what we said, to get a transfer quarterback or, you know, even to start a younger player, but he's been, like I said, he's been reluctant to do that, but he may have his hand forced to do that. And I got the year wrong. First year was 2008. I had actually just finished law school, was starting out as an attorney and we had a new baby then. So my memory got are- it. My memories are fuzzy. Now, with, you know, if we had the college football playoff expanded now, this game would have a little more meaning the ACC championship game. That'll yeah, happen next year. So that should be great. But I don't, I, I guess we're not going to see really much in the way of coaching changes this year. You know, well, we had, yeah, we did. We, of course, we had one, right? We had Georgia Tech, you know, 
you know, Brent Key is, ta- you know, Brent Key is taken over. And I think that was the right, I think that was the right, I think that was probably the right decision. They looked like they played at more inspiring football under him. Yep. You know, I mean, you know, than they did uh, obviously under Jeff Collins and, you know, my, my, my esteemed friend, he, he can tell you more about this when he comes on with you sometime, but Jeff was happy that they didn't hire Willie Fritz. He was happy. I think he was very happy about that, but, you know, but some people think that Georgia tech perhaps should have hired Willie Fritz from, right from Tulane. But, you know, I think they get, the, you know, people get gun shy, I guess, as they say, like you have a, a hire that maybe looks good on, on paper, like Justin Fuente did. And it doesn't turn out well at all. Right. And he, he was a, you know, a coach at a, you know, at a group of five school and, you know, he, he had some success right at Memphis, but it didn't pan out at Virginia tech. Now, Willie Fritz was less successful than Justin Fuente was at uh, Memphis. You know, Willie Fritz was, was less successful at Tulane I'm using that as a comparison. And so I think Jeff was probably happy that they hired, you know, he was happy that they went with Brent Key. And, that, and it sounds like there will be a favorable, you know, financial deal in place. And they weren't going to make any big moves anyway for that coach, Ben, because, you know, you know, the, who knows if in a year, a couple, a year or two, if they take, you know, take action on, on jo- Josh Pastner, right. The, the, uh, men, the men's basketball coach at Georgia tech, you know, that's, you know, he is a couple of years removed from having an ACC title. So he's bought himself some time, even though it was in a COVID year, but he's bought himself some time and that, you know, so, they just, you know, I think if you're looking at that as an AD, you've got to take all those financial factors in place. And the new uh, new athletic director at Georgia Tech is, um, from what we hear, is a prolific fundraiser, and he'll be spending a lot of time doing that. So, but other than that, I mean, it feels like Boston College should make a move, but they won't. You know, and so, you know, I think you're right for the most part. I mean, it's going to be pretty quiet in the off season because there were a lot of teams that made a, made action, made made moves. I don't think NC State. Well, you know, NC State's not going to make a move. You know, you never really make a move on coaches that are eight and four, right? You know, so it's. I think for the most part, the coaching is going to be coaching carousel is going to be pretty quiet in the ACC. Where I think you'll hear the noise is in the transfer portal market. Yeah, and I'm looking at the – I don't think you see any – I'm looking at the ACC website right now for the standings. I don't think there's going to be any changes in the Coastal. The teams who didn't do well are all coming off coaching changes last year. Then you look at Boston College, disaster. Syracuse, I mean, you start 6-0, and but then you finish 1-5. and That's not ideal. The cat that is Scott Satterfield and has 10 million lives somehow keeps surviving. Seven and five is not awe-inspiring, but they looked better to your point in the second half of the season. Yes. The only the only one that interests me here, and this would be the coach's choice, is if Clawson just says, I've done everything I can do at Wake. I gotta go somewhere else. He to me, he feels like he can stay there as long as he wants to, you know what I mean? To just be like, you know, he can have like probably have lifetime job security. And there's, there's something about that in today's profession, right. Where you can stay at, at a position long enough and be and be successful. He can perhaps be, you know, you know, perhaps be, I don't want to put coach K's term here, right. But be that long-term coach that stays at, at Wake Forest for a long time, be that Skip Prosser, you know, that can stay at Wake Forest for a long time. And I think that that's, and I think his family seems to be, seems to be happy there. They were throwing his name out for the Virginia tech job. And I, and I would have been supportive if he would have came to, came to Virginia tech, you know, I think, but I think he was throwing his name out there for Virginia tech. So his agent could get him some more cash at Wake Forest, you know? So, uh, you know, I think he'll, I think he'll be there for, I think he'll be there for a while because I think his family enjoys, enjoys being down in that area of the country. And I think he's done well there. His culture has been such that, I mean, right before that he was at, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but I think he was at, at Bowling Green before that, that he was at Richmond and before that he was at Fordham. So he spent time in this, you know, in this private college sector, 
where he's just done well with those sorts of, he's done well with those sorts of institutions where he, where he has to build something up and, you know, kind of from scratch and mold it in the vision that he wants. And I think he's done pretty well. And he was also the coach at Richmond where they have a former detective yep. uh, who was a uh, <laughs> <Right. laughs> coach. Mike London. Um, well, <laughs> what, so what's on the horizon? We, we kind of joked about this, but, the future of the ACC, it just seems like they are, the conference is doing nothing and just letting all this unfold around them. And the conference used to be ahead of the curve on that stuff. You know, you got Florida state in, you got Virginia tech, you got Miami, you know, you got big time schools to come in, you know, I mean, to, to think that that a conference that had Virginia Tech, Florida State, and Miami all come into it is now just getting left behind. It's kind of hard to fathom. Yes. I mean, it is. And, you know, I, I, I wrote about this at allsportsdiscussion.com a little bit, right? I mean, a while back, I wrote about, I think it was in the mid-'80s. There was a doctoral student at Virginia Tech 1985, 1985, who wrote about long-term strategic planning in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Can you believe that? At Virginia Tech, this, this person wrote about and said that recommended that the conference use the tools of long-term strategic planning in its future, you know, in its future plan, in its future planning. And I was, and I, and I'm wondering if anybody's done a follow-up dissertation on that subject. And I thought that might be a good dissertation for me, Ben, <laughs> to follow up on the recommendations, because I, I really haven't seen our conference commissioner, Jim Phillips, say much about it. But what the what the plans are for the what the plans are for the future? I mean, I, I, I think the, I mean, I think from a financial perspective, it's working for ESPN. Job Jeff's blogged about this several times before. The ACC network is a, is a money maker for the conference, and the ACC has a vested interest in providing a. The ACC, excuse me, ESPN has a vested interest in providing a quality product, right? Because they are, you know, they don't want to see a, a profitable enterprise that they have go down the tubes, right? I mean, I. You know, I don't know if you've seen the tweets lately from Heather Danich at ESPN, but they're clearly trying to troll the Big Ten because they're upset that they lost <laughs> lost the Big Ten media media rights right to, to to other teams. But that means that if if you're upset than that, you could probably you should probably make your make your deal a little better for the ACC because you know you don't want to have your you don't want to have your blueprint your at your economic blueprint go to go to pot. Simply because, simply because, the you know one of your one of your conferences that's on your that you showcase on your network is fall is falling apart, and I and I, and I don't think ESPN wants that either. I mean, I, I'm talking about a lot about the networks here, Ben, because TV controls so much of college athletics now, right? So it's hard not to talk about that. But they'll they're going to want they have a vested interest in the ACC performing properly because you don't you don't want to see what you don't want to see Ben is you don't want to see college football become women's basketball and UConn winning it every year you know and I, and I, they don't want it to become boring for the fans is my point is my point and I think that was one of the reasons that they that they got to this 12 team football chase you know if you remember a few years ago when Virginia Tech won the Orange Bowl at 10 and 4 they got hot at the right time at the end of the season right just won a series of games, you know, perhaps something can happen like that in this new college football playoff picture for the, you know, for the ACC, if you get hot, if somebody gets hot at the right time, you know, is in like, you know, I suspect, you know, Florida state's going to win their next game. I'm sure they're going to win their next game. You know, our team's going to, if you had a series of three games after that, would there be teams that want to would want to play Florida state? That's an iffy proposition because they're starting to, you know, they're starting to get hot. You know, so those are the sites. That, those are, I mean, I, I think the twelve-team playoff will probably help save the save the ACC for now, but they're going to have to. Uh, you know, Jim Phillips and others are going to have to do some more with strategic planning in terms of promoting the conference and for striking financial deals. The com, you know, we're going to find out the big, uh, the larger impact of the Comcast edition probably later. That you know, 
more so later this year, right? Because I waited it out until I got Comcast because I have a monopoly provider here in Alexandria. So I kind of had to wait it out. And then, you know, when we, you know, when we uh, got these other providers and they're coming in, if I went to uh, like another streamer in YouTube or something like that, I'd almost be paying the same thing. So I decided to wait it out and just saw, you know, games with friends and things like that on the ACC network in the last year. But we're going to find out more about that. Well, I think there are schools in the Big 12, uh, not in the Big 12, excuse me, the Pac-12 that could be talked to. And there's always a lot that we don't know. So I hope that we're having some conversations. I don't want us to become just the coastal conference, but we've got to expand or we're going to die. So, and I'd hate to see it go away because this is a good conference. It's a great basketball conference and it's a, it's a, it's a very good football conference. People just don't realize it. I agree. I mean, and I think they should set up, you know, at a minimum, you know, and Jeff and I have talked about this before too, where you have a scheduling arrangement between, you know, Pac-12 schools and the AC, ACC schools and that sort of thing. I remember a few years back when Ralph Fridgen was at the University of Maryland, they always put, they always found a way to play some Pac-12 school. They played California. I mean, California came all the way out here in August. They had those those poor guys had no idea what the humidity would be like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was sort of hilarious. It was kind of hilarious. It was, yeah. So it kind of brings me back to why did, why did Maryland ever fire? Well, Ralph Friedgen and hire Randy Edsel, but that's a different story. And, uh, but yes, I would like to see, I would certainly love to see, I would certainly love to see a scheduling arrangement at a minimum between the two conferences. And we'll find out, we'll find out just more where, where things happen. But I think that, you know, that I don't think that you're going to see any big moves on conference realignment for the next, you know, next couple of years. Well, let's see here. We've covered the football season, the disappointments, the ups and downs. I think we've covered just about everything. The coach of the year, Coach Elko, great job. Once again, Nina King, thank you for hiring him. I don't know what else we've got to talk about. Why don't we throw in a prediction for tomorrow's championship game, and then you get an open mic and talk about anything you want to talk about. Okay, so I think that Cle- I, I, I think Clemson will win. I think that their defense is probably too much for North Carolina. And I think it will be a little closer than the experts think, but at Clemson will probably win, win in the end. And I think they'll be ACC champions, ACC champions again. I'm going to agree with you. I think Clemson's going to win. Uh, I, I'm not good at predicting scores, but it wouldn't surprise me if the margin of victories is, is as low as three. Although if you get to that, I think that probably favors Carolina. But I think 10 or more is possible if Clemson just pulls away late. And if they just keep giving the ball to Shipley, then it's going to be hard for Carolina to answer that. So we'll see what happens. So, all right. Uh, Matthew, this is second time on. You've been very generous with your time. I appreciate it. This has been great as always. And you've had me on your podcast, which I appreciate. So, uh, take over, man. Open mic floor is yours. Well, I'll tell you, uh, let me ask you, how about let me, letting me ask you a question here. All right. North Carolina should be a lot better than they are in men's basketball right now. Is that right? Well, I kind of feel like I can't say anything about that, uh, given the last two times that they matched up against the Blue Devils. So I I think I'll say this. Manic not being there is not helpful. And they did start slow last year, and then they got hot. So were it not for the way that the Blue Devils – as an administration went out of their way to disrespect Carolina in coach K's last home game. I would feel a little bit more comfortable talking smack right now, but I don't think I have the right to do that yet. Well, I actually think Virginia tech has a chance to win on Sunday. I mean, let me put it this way. Okay. So I went to college at Charleston. Okay. And we beat the Hokies. And we have a really good history of beating Carolina. 
So you know by playing College of Charleston what it takes to beat the Tar Heels now, right? So, you know, I think that that prepared you for that, and I hope you guys do beat them. I hope you run them out of the building. I think we have a – well, I mean, one thing for sure is that if we go – would you agree perhaps that Sean Padula is one of the most improved ACC players? Yeah. I mean, I think he, I think that by the season's end, he's going to win that award because he's the, I think he is the fastest guard I've seen at Virginia Tech in several, in, in quite some time, quite some time. And just, just in terms of, you know, moving up and down the floor. Now, he's not like the NBA players, of course, that Buzz had, but he's a pretty fast player. And his first step to the hoop is just, is faster than a lot, a lot of players in the ACC doesn't have the height that others that the other that you know that's <laughs> that they do at duke or north carolina but they play a pretty disciplined plant brand of basketball and against virginia tech you're not going to have a whole lot of possessions right so you got to make every possession count and i will be interested to see what happens on sunday because there's a lot of weird things that happen in the dungeon of castle coliseum a lot of weird things that you see a lot of shots that you think are going in that don't go in there and I think there's, and I, you know, I like, I like the way Virginia Tech's playing right now. I think Virginia Tech is going to be one of those teams that's in the mix, in the, you know, in the mix for the NCAA tournament. Right now, today, I'm probably looking at seven, 17, you know, probably six or seven teams. I think there's a, probably a steep drop off after that. I shouldn't say a steep drop, steep drop off. There's perhaps a steep drop off, but the muddy middle is probably a, you know, little, little, stronger this season you know so i'll be interested to see that clemson's look like look looks like they have improved a bit i was impressed to impressed to see the ac the acc won the big acc big 10 challenge you know so that was you know that was a good thing i didn't expect the pittsburgh panthers to be shooting like the phoenix suns that was shocking to me yeah cables having a rough go of things (laughs) they looked good though the other night they look really good you know, against Northwestern, I was impressed. That's one that I didn't think was going to happen, and they looked they looked pretty good that night. And if they can shoot like that more often, Ben, they may surprise a few people. You know, they may surprise a few people. They've obviously got a good center in John Hewley. You know, we'll just have to see what happens next. But I'm I'm excited for ACC men's basketball this year. I think that I think that the ACC is going to find find a way to have some teams here teams. Uh, Certainly in the mix for the NCAA tournament, maybe even D- NCAA, maybe even deep runs. Last year, the ACC got no credit and had some teams making some deep runs to the, you know, to the obviously to the Final Four, not just there, but you know, to the Sweet Sixteen as well. So I think I, I don't expect any different this year. Well, and looking at the teams right now, you got UVA, Miami, NC State, Virginia Tech, Wake, Notre Dame, Duke, and then Clemson. And then Boston College, North Carolina, and Pitt are all five and three, right? So uh, this is going to be an interesting year for Duke. People online are already furious at Shire, it seems like, when the two games that they've lost. But I, I'd be interested to hear your take on this. We've seen this with young teams before, you know, the the Matt Hurt years uh, and uh, the Jabari Parker years where they just yep. weren't as good. It, it happens when you go with young guys. Sure. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any reason to be concerned about that. No. Uh, but the, I think the question is going to be how high the ceiling is for Duke and then who breaks out from maybe that, like you said, the muddy middle. The I, I agree with you. I agree with you. If I could say, though, I am disappointed in Florida State. Florida State should be a lot better than where they are. Now, it's true that they they have, you know, a couple of players that are not available that were not available. I think they had a player under suspension. But I, I don't think that that necessarily puts you in a position where you should be lo- losing to basketball powerhouse Nebraska either. Right. And so, you know, I I, I think the only way that Florida State would make the NCAA tournament right now, Ben, is if they w- were to win the ACC tournament. That's where I met with Florida State. And what about Louisville? What is going on? I mean, <laughs> there, there, you know, I kind of miss, 
<laughs> I'm chuckling a little bit because I'm going to put another, another reference to Virginia Tech here, but it's a different reference. I think that they're kind of at the same edge of the talent scale for football. Like, you know, where Virginia Tech is set for football, that's where Louisville is set for men's basketball right now. That's kind of where they're at. And so they may have to turn over a significant portion of that roster. Now, I'll be fair right to Kenny Payne just a little bit. Um, he, you know, a lot of that roster kind of cleared out when he left, you know, so he didn't really get a chance to, you know, to try and recruit some of those players to stay to, you know, some of their best, at least to try to stay in, but that's kind of where they're at. Ben. they have to, and he, and he lost a couple of significant recruit, you know, recruiting battles, right. For top five players. One, of course, real significant in state to Kentucky, of course. And then the, the, but he is bringing in a couple of top 100 players next year. So there is that. So he is bringing some players in. So it's going to just, it's going to take him a while to bring in some players for his own, for his own system. And then, like I said, they're, they need to get their, their, their roster up to an ACC caliber. Well, I feel bad for Nolan Smith being at Louisville, dealing with what he's dealing with, but, um, the Russian misinformation sports bots may go after the Louisville program. We didn't even get to that. We talked about it earlier this year. You said that you've noticed the the bots going after sports uh, programs. What's going on with that? Well, okay, so it's interesting because I, I work in the I work in the I work in the national security community, right? And I'm just and I'm so what I'm giving you is not not an opinion based on my employer but it's more based on my my studies right i'm in a i'm in a, in a graduate program for right now a national security graduate program and if you get these bot i think they're learning where these where where um all segments of society <laughs> have some sense of politics related to them and if they can get themselves embedded into these communities it stirs up stirs up you know disinformation and passing disinformation and passing, you know, and just pat, you know, pat, 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 you know, getting people riled up and that sort of thing. And we're better to do that than in ri- in ri- rivalries and that that sort that sort of thing. And a lot of these, <laughs> you look at a lot of these co- collegiate communities, they're like swing states. You know what I mean? Swing states, swing voting areas that can probably change the voting landscape of the state. The University of Michigan's a good example, Ann Arbor, right? <laughs> or most of the communities in the nine one nine. Right. I mean that, you know, if they're if they're if all their people are voting, then that's specifically in college communities, it can change the outcome of an election. And so that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, another space where you see disinformation. By the way, I have to give you an extreme compliment. I can't remember the guest's name. I love Yes. How awesome was that podcast? It was like one of my favorite. That was one of the favorite. I, I hope you ask him back because that was like one of my favorites of yours ever and i don't really think, good yeah no thank you i, I really appreciate that the, the the guest really brought the host up a level but the the thing that was fun about that was we barely got into sports i mean yes. i kind of i kind of felt like we had to force our way into that topic it was just real real informative hearing about his observations on the war in Ukraine and what was happening there and the economic side of things. So I, I really, I, I had a blast having that conversation with George. It was a lot of fun. You should ask him to come back on because Ben, there's some hardcore sanctions that are coming. And I will be interested to see how Russia survives through, through all of that. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, Twitter may outlast Russia. We'll see, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to George. I, I, I've been thinking about that. I, I think that would be a good topic. He's a very good, very good uh, guest to have on. He's been a supporter of uh, of my Twitter account and and the site and the interviews. So that was a lot of fun. But well, what else do you want to talk about? You, you've been very generous with your time. I, I appreciate you coming on. I really enjoy your podcast. Uh, it, the one that you guys had with the with the gentleman who covered Virginia Tech and talked about what was going on at UVA that was a great episode recently. I really uh, it's a tragic 
tragic thing that happened, but the way that he talked about that, I thought it was very informative and just outstanding. So, you know, it, uh, we've covered a lot, but if there's anything else, I'll give you two open mics. No, we appreciate you. We appreciate the kind words there. That was uh, Hank Kurtz. He's the uh, state of Virginia's AP sports writer, the Associated Press sports writer. So he does everything in the state of Virginia. So he'll do NASCAR down, you know, down there in Martinsville. He'll do ODU or VCU or JMU sport, you know, JMU athletics, if they're ever playing each other, he'll do, you know, he'll do pretty much everything in this state. He's in Charlottesville. He's at Blacksburg. He's just all over the place. And he was, <coughs> he was an outstanding guest. So, I mean, and he's, he generally comes on at the beginning of the year when we preview kind of Commonwealth football, you wouldn't talk about Virginia and Virginia tech. Then he comes on at the end of the year. And so it's always nice to have him come on um, this upcoming Sunday. We're going to have Brett, Brett Cian, Ciencia from pick six previews. He's going to come on our show this Sunday and he's outstanding. So we, he's coming up Then we have Matt Semek coming up here at the end of the year. And that's how we kind of close the pot, you know, kind of close the year out. He, if you remember college football news.com, I'm not sure. Yeah. He was a role, part of their stable of writers over there when that site was just cooking. And he's always gracious with his time. He's from, he lives in, in, in Arizona right now. And he, he comes on twice. He comes on twice a year as well to help us preview ACC football and then help kind of, kind of to close out the year. So we just, <laughs> it's kind of like what you're saying. The guests make the show, right. You know, and we had just, you know, we've enjoyed doing, we've enjoyed doing it. I mean, I think it's going to be our 436th episode on Sunday. You know, so we've just been doing this for year, doing this for years, but we haven't forgot that just the best guests that we have are grassroots, you know, normal people like us who have their pulse on their teams, right? Who have the pulse on their teams. And that's, that's really what make our, makes our show is the grassroots guests that we get, you know, the grassroots guests that we get. And that's, that, that's what makes it so fun and so rewarding. Now, there we go. Okay, I hope I haven't lost the mic here, but we'll see what happens. Um, I hope this is still recording. Tell Brett we said hello, we're trying to get him on. Uh, so uh, find sounds time. good. All right, can you hear right, me? Man. I can hear you. Okay, we'll, we'll try to have him on. So, why don't we just go ahead and wrap this up? Follow us at Duke FB coverage on Twitter, go to our site, bullcitycoordinators.com. Dad, hang in there. I hope you're doing well. I'll be in touch. Hopefully get down to see you soon. Matthew, thanks a lot. I appreciate it coming on. And as always, go Duke.